premise of this next brief section is to pick up some of the points actually that colleagues have made, but it's not what you say that matters, it's what people hear that matters. And when you encode a word or a phrase or a type of language, particularly in politics and particularly in the union movement, you are encoding it for the meaning you hope will be transmitted, but may well not actually be the meaning that has been received at the other end of that process. So if you psychologists and psychologists will tell you, the encoder-decoder sort of process leads to scrambling along the way, and what people hear is often not what you meant. Um, and this is, a, of course, incredibly important, because you've got limited resources, you want people to do things. The great insight I sometimes offer up to my clients in the union movement is that communications is designed to do one or two of th two things, to change the way people think and to change the way they behave. And that's it. That's all you can expect. So whether you're flogging beans or you're trying to recruit people to a union or you're trying to get people to go on a demo or give you money or vote for you, whatever it might be, all you're trying to do, and I say, oh, it's the biggest thing in the world, isn't it? To change the way they think and to change the way they behave. So if you think about the terms you use and the language that you deploy, make sure that what, how you're encoding it is going to be the same as how it's been decoded. If I ask you to define uh, a very simple term, let's say PC, if I'd like to write down what does PC mean, you might decode it in all kinds of different ways. What, what does PC mean, Tom? Um, it means politically correct or police constable. Does it? Depending on where you're coming from. Police constable, they don't have police constable. <coughs> Personal computer. Personal computer. Yeah. If I invited you for dinner, what time are you going to turn up? <laughs> now. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Three minutes past twelve for the colleague here. Um, it might be at seven o'clock tonight, mightn't it? Same with tea. When's tea? Point is, you encode it with a certain meaning, which may be translated entirely differently. And of course, addressing union conferences where people are drawn from different regions of the UK, and different nations within the UK, different words have completely different meanings in different parts of the UK. Uh, if I was to say, let's go and get a bread roll at lunch, right, how many people would use the word bread roll rather than cob or bap or barn cake or, if you're from Surrey, for capture, uh, whatever it might be. You should see what's on the, on the menu. Um, uh, and uh, another example might be, uh, what's the, if you live in a house, a sort of row of houses, what's the alley or the sort of roadway behind the houses called? Anyone come up with a name for that? Ginnel, thank you. Anyone heard it called a twitchin or a twitten? Alleyway, back alley. Yeah, northerners and you know others, Midlands, different names. And the point is, you go to Grimsby, they call it one thing, and you go to Scunthorpe, they call it something else. If you're trying to sell a government policy, which is to have keys to gates on the backs of these alleys, so the space is liberated for residents to go out and use shared space, and drops the burglary rate, it makes people feel safer and you call it the wrong thing, then all that effort is being completely wasted just to use one small term wrong by a few streets. Uh, and the other aspect of this is, of course, that words that have connotations which may be negative from the ones that the, uh, the owner of those words intended. The inheritance tax becomes the death tax. Oil drilling becomes energy exploration, uh, to spin it the other way. Hands up who knows what the community charge is or was. Hands up who knows what the poll tax is or was. <laughs> and we successfully dubbed that the poll tax so that the only people calling it community charge were Michael Portillo and some of the other government <laughs> Tory ministers at the time. And so words have these meanings. I'm trying to mount a campaign at the moment around a big society so that when anyone ever opens their mouth and says big society, the only thing people hear is cuts, Tory cuts. And I've even heard people start to talk about the big society cuts. It's conflating the two ideas in one, and just making that poisonous like strickening before <coughs> people can get off the ground. So words have meanings. And of course for the union movement this is terribly important. If you go into a meeting talking in the language uh, of unionism um, and talking about collective bargaining and shop stewards and all the other things, then you are creating an immediate barrier to understanding. You're creating a, a mood that somehow you're distinct from the workforce, that you're distinct from everyday life, that it's a generational gap. Often in my union, the NEJ, we have mothers of chapel and fathers of chapel. 
which makes it sound like the Masons, I think, to many potential new members. And I'm not against tradition, I'm not against this, but what I'm saying is if you expect people to understand you, if you're using those kinds of terms, then you may be waiting a long time. Jargon, of course, is in every field. Doctors use it, taxi drivers use it, politicians use it, you know, it's, it's there. But it's used often to exclude. It's used to create an us and them. When a doctor writes GPL on a patient's chart and it means good for parts only, <laughs> they don't want the patient to know what that means when they write normal for Norfolk NFN on a patient's chart. They don't want the patient to know what that means. So they have their own terminology, which they <laughs> claim they don't use anymore, but I don't believe it. Um, C or P, I saw them once, which they, the, the patient said, Are you saying that's Catholic or Protestant? They know it's cornflakes or porridge. But, you know, these terminologies, these jargons appear in any kind of sector, usually designed to exclude and to create a us and them feeling. So there's no way on earth that the union should be in that same boat of using jargon to exclude. Uh, if you've ever read uh, Orwell's Politics of the English Language, which is a short, sharp essay written by the greatest writer of the English language, of course, um, in 1946, uh, there, this gives us so many insights into the way forward, I think. He makes the point in that essay, uh, which is that not only does sloppy, lazy thinking lead to sloppy, lazy language, but actually the other way around, too. If we've only got sloppy, lazy language, it will lead to sloppy thinking. And you'll know in 1984, his great novel, the uh, character Winston Smith's job was to remove words from the English language. Yeah, that was his job, to make a dictionary ever smaller, because with a, a limited dictionary, then thought was limited, and a compliant population and a dictatorship would be limited similarly from thinking creative thoughts. Uh, and so the insight there is that basically, if you're using words that you assume everyone else knows what they mean, it's sloppy, it's, it's narrow and so on, then it, it restricts the way we think and operate, it restricts the way we organise, it restricts the way we reach out to particularly um, young people. I'm very struck by the colleague from Prospect's point about the word management. I mean, a very simple, good example, actually, of, of a word meaning one thing to one group of people, but to most of the population, it's a neutral term, possibly a beneficial term. Things should be managed. Shouldn't they? You know, we don't, we don't expect anarchy in free markets, we expect management. Um, in the, on the left, the word planning, you know, that used to be something we believed in, didn't it? Planning. Um, and that got negative connotations which should be reclaimed. So all of these words have to be stress tested, really. Um, and so if you're thinking about union, I'm coming to the end of my time now, I know, the person you should be pitching this stuff at is an imaginary 14 year old, not a student, but a 14 year old, somebody with a perfectly normal level of intelligence but with a low level of knowledge. Somebody who can understand things perfectly well if they're explained in clear, plain, beautiful language, short words, short sentences, acronyms explained, jargon stripped out. And if you don't have a 14-year-old at home to test this stuff on, um, just put yourself in their shoes and imagine a 14-year-old. You don't need an expensive focus group. You don't actually need an expensive consultant. Right? What you need is just to think yourself into the position of somebody who may be receiving your leaflet or your speech or whatever it is, or your tweets or your uh, website and so on, and stress test it against those, that, that basic 14 year old test. Um, simple words, short words, the KISS principle, the short symbols applies in speeches as well as does in the written word. Uh, and final thought is that if your words are a barrier to understanding, you need to stop using them and think of them in terms of being a bridge to understanding. If you do that, then the rest follows from it. Thanks very much for listening.